Imagine sitting around a dinner table with your family, just having a lovely Sunday dinner. But then your father breaks the silence of the meal to ask a question. That question causes everyone to stop eating and look at your father with confusion. Why did he ask that? You think to yourself as you look at your family. The question wasn't appropriate for our dinner conversation. The question was, do you want to be buried or cremated when you die? That was the question John Liss asked his wife Helen, his mother Alma, and his children Patricia, John Jr. and Frederick. A man who most described as boring didn't just ask this question because he was concerned for his family's futures. No. He had motives and he would leave behind a scene of horror before going on the run for 18 years. John List was born September 17, 1925 in Bay City, Michigan to John Frederick and Alma List. John's father was a strict and overly devout Lutheran man. To John's father, he was pretty much nothing. In fact, John Frederick bought a house, remodeled the upstairs to an apartment to rent out, and made his son sleep in the first floor lounge. John Frederick was kind of a prick, but not surprising considering he married John List's mother, Alma, who was 20 years his junior, and a hospice nurse that took care of John's first wife when she was dying. John Frederick also never called John by his name, only referring to him as the boy. So John's father never really cared for him at all. But in John Frederick, John learned a defining trait that will become important later. The lesson he learned from his father was to never accept handouts, to work for everything you have according to John Frederick and John List himself later, that failure was a weakness. And also to be a very strict Lutheran. I'm not going into critiquing faiths of any kind, but John's father and a lot of people in the community that he grew up in thought being poor was a punishment from God. They for some reason believe that God and Jesus rewarded the faithful who worked hard with prosperity and any type of handout was seen as being not faithful. So to them, capitalism was godly. This is all important for later on, I promise. But Alma, on the other hand, didn't see her son as an afterthought. She was overprotective and domineering. Alma wouldn't let him play with other kids. Hell, she would make him hold her hand when walking well into his teenage years, which is slightly creepy. So normally this combination of overbearing and overprotective mother and an overly strict father makes serial killers and other type of criminals. But it just made John List the most boring person on the planet planet. He was always described as just there. Nothing more. No personality traits that set him apart. Nothing. Even as a kid, he cared more about following orders and laws than he did about having fun. He was so obedient, he only got in trouble in school twice. The one was for running. Let that sink in. He got in trouble for running. In 1943, he graduated high school. In 1944, his father, John Frederick, died. He enlisted in the Army and served as a lab technician during World War II. Discharged in 1946, he went to college in Ann Arbor. There, he would eventually earn a master's degree in accounting. But in 1950, he was recalled to the Army during the Korean War. Stationed at Fort Eustis, Virginia, he would end up meeting Helen. Let's talk about Helen. Helen lived near the base and was a widow of a soldier killed during the Korean War. With that soldier, she had a daughter named Brenda, who for some reason disappears from the history of this family after being named in articles. Only thing that comes up is she left in 1960 and was married. So either she is still alive somewhere as an old woman or she died sometime. Well, John kinda liked her enough to break some biblical teachings. Not the first time he's going to, by the way, and it's not going to be the last. Because John was a really boring person, he picked and chose what to follow when it came to the Bible. And this was one of the things he chose not to. So, when she claimed to be pregnant, his old-fashioned nature reared its ugly head. John and Helen were married on December 1st, 1951. And, surprise, she wasn't pregnant. She lied. But because John didn't believe in divorce, he ended up staying in the marriage with a woman who also had syphilis that she contracted from her previous husband. Another thing that she didn't tell John List. 
She wasn't one for being truthful about very much. Also, she ended up getting a lazy eye, which probably came in useful with her children, as she can keep an eye at two of them at once. But that was a joke in poor taste, and I'm not ashamed of it. They ended up having three kids together, moving to where John could get work. First Kalamazoo, then Rochester, New York, and then finally in 1965, Jersey City, New Jersey. There, the family, which I will go into greater detail the next segment, moved into a 19-room Victorian mansion in Westfield. John had gotten a job as a vice president of a bank, meaning they were set for life. You would think Helen would be happy with overly boring husband and a big-ass house. But no, she was an alcoholic who insulted him a lot. Not surprising, she seems like a real peach of a person. Lying to get a dude to marry her, keeping the fact that she had an STD from her husband, and syphilis was treatable even back then. So why the fuck did she never get it treated? Either way, the marriage started dysfunctional, and continue to get more dysfunctional. So we are in the 60s now when problems began to get even more troubling. But let's start with them moving into the mansion. Some neighbors baked them a pie to welcome them to the neighborhood. They knocked on the door and John List answered. By opening the door just a tiny bit, seeing the pie, saying they do not accept handouts, and then shutting the door in their face. Such a sweet, boring man, isn't he? But it was in Kalamazoo where all three of the List children were born. Patricia, the oldest, John Jr., the middle child, and Frederick the youngest. This was the 60s, so there were hippies everywhere. Hippies, counterculture, plus overly religious man equals stricter dad. So when Patricia took an interest in acting, well, John got a bit concerned. Why was he concerned? Well, John thought that acting was no better than prostitution. What probably didn't help was Helen becoming a recluse, a drunk, and a constantly humiliating presence in John's life. John himself really had only friends in his church, where he taught Sunday school for a brief time before the pastor asked him to stop because he was just boring the kids. Anyways, he began to feel like his family was pulling away from the church and from God. Whether this was true is irrelevant because things were getting progressively worse and worse for John. A wife who was becoming more and more unstable, a daughter who he felt was getting into a culture of sin and vice, two boys who honestly probably didn't do anything but because the oldest was starting to go into sin and vice, probably thought they were too. I know John Jr. played sports so maybe John Sr. thought he was straying as well. Frederick, who knows? He was a young kid, and apparently he was a very sweet kid, so maybe he was acting like kids do, and his father assumed sin. Not that he was a good father or attentive either way. He was just as cold as his father was. But it takes a lot to do with what John List ended up doing. There has to be a reason for it in his own mind. The family problems was the fuse. It was lit. The powder keg, though, was something else entirely. John got fired from his job a year after getting it, which was a humiliation he decided not to share with the family, also one he could not understand. You see, he had been successful up until that point, well arguably, but a financial crisis hit and well, he lost his job. He couldn't understand and to him, God should have protected him from this, but he couldn't face his family with this as well. He hid it by every morning getting up putting on a suit and leaving, but he would go to a train station for eight hours and read the paper. He, then he would come home every night like nothing was wrong. So he lied. Totally a good Christian man, huh? He would skim from his life savings and even his mother's to make ends meet. Oh yeah, I forgot. Alma was living with the family, moving with them to the estate they lived in. Sorry, she does come up later, so I have no excuse for not bringing her up before. But to John, Jesus solution wasn't an option. He could have told his family, collected welfare, sold their home, and moved. But to him, all of that wasn't possible. Because of how he was raised, he could not share issues with his own family. And welfare was a handout for poor people. And to him, poor people were sinners who deserved to be poor. And his home was a status of his own success. He wasn't content at being middle class. He wanted upper middle class or even upper class. But slowly over the months and years, the debt was piling. He did find work, but it was never enough. In 1971, he was working as a home insurance agent, but again, the income wasn't enough to keep the mansion. The house went into foreclosure, and John was the only one who knew about it. That was when he began to rationalize 
everything. His children moving away from religion. His marriage being one big lie after another. He didn't believe in divorce. He didn't want his children to suffer the indignities that he thought in his own mind. He thought that they could not survive being poor. So to him, there was only one action he could take. In his mind, if he hurried, his family would be in heaven and they wouldn't have to suffer financial hardships. And thus, we come to the scenario that I opened this video with. There is evidence to prove that he talked to his family about killing them a couple of times. Patricia's drama teacher stated later that Patricia came to him sobbing because her father had told them that he was planning on killing them all and asked how they wanted to be buried. But the teacher did nothing, which is why I am not naming him on here because Fuck him, he could have at least attempted to help the family, but chose to remain quiet. Patricia also told others that if she didn't go to school or show up for anything, to assume that she was killed by her father. So it's safe to assume John was planning on killing her, her brother, her grandmother, and her mother. So, we're going to talk about the only interesting thing about John List. He was a true crime buff. He learned from reading true crime books, magazines, and articles and meticulously planned what he was going to do. And on November 9th, 1971, he enacted his plan. Strap in everybody, because this is going to be a very long one. So a month before he enacted his plan, he went to the police station to obtain a handgun permit. Which a requirement of that is to get fingerprinted. This becomes important later. But for now, put it in the back of your mind. This was a name though, because not only did he not need the permit, but he never even bothered to pick it up. At first, according to a later confession, John wanted to kill his family on November 1st, which is All Saints Day. He figured they would go to heaven faster that way. The reason that he didn't was because he allowed his daughter to host a Halloween party in one of the ballrooms of this mansion. Which, by the way, was uncharacteristic of John List. He hated Halloween because he thought it was a devil's holiday. At 8.30 in the morning of November 9th, 1971, the milkman came by the house, only to find a note by John List stating that all milk deliveries be stopped until further notice. According to this letter, they were going out of town on vacation. He even canceled his newspaper twice once before November 9th and once the day of. He was covering his tracks. He knew from studying true crime that he needed time. The longer his actions go unnoticed, the farther away he could have gotten. But newspapers would just pile up, so he got rid of it. The milkman coming around can find things suspicious, so he got rid of that. As soon as the children were at school and he knew that no one else would be coming to the house, he enacted his plan. He waited in the kitchen for Helen to come downstairs at 9 a.m. for her coffee. Then, as she sat to have her coffee, he shot her in the jaw at point-blank range with his 22 Colt revolver. Once she fell over and he realized all he did was wound her, he shot her several more times until she was dead. Knowing that the noise would arouse suspicion from his mother Alma, he rushed upstairs to Alma's personal kitchen. Which he was right, because when he entered and saw her also having coffee, she asked what the noise was. He raised the gun and fired one shot, hitting his mother above the left eye. One of the key points of his plan was to place the body somewhere where no one would find them, for a while at least. So he had planned on putting them all in sleeping bags in the ballroom. Problem was, Alma he couldn't, because she was too heavy and she was upstairs. So he wrapped her in a carpet runner and dragged her body to a small utility room. He then cleaned up the blood upstairs before heading down to deal with his wife's body. He then dragged her to the ballroom, leaving a 40-foot trail of blood in its wake. He laid her on a sleeping bag, then rolled her into it. After covering her fully with a bathrobe and towels as well, he cleaned up the long streak of blood her body left. After throwing up and needing to compose himself, he put on a fresh suit and tie, then called his boss to cancel a meeting. John's excuse was that Helen's mother had become deathly ill, so the family was going to North Carolina to be with her. He wrote letters to the kids' schools with the same excuse at this time as well. Then, since apparently he had time to kill, no pun intended, he went outside and raked leaves in his yard, in a suit and tie. Just let that sink in. This guy had time to rake his own lawn, but he did it in a suit and tie. But then his plans got messed up a bit. Patricia wasn't due home until 5 p.m., which would have made her the last to die. 
but she called home saying she wasn't feeling well. So John went and picked her up and drove her to the house. Once she was inside, he aimed the gun at the back of her head and fired once. She would be the only one who didn't see the gun aimed at her. She died instantly, and like before, he dragged her to the ballroom, wrapped her in a sleeping bag, and cleaned up the mess. After again changing into another suit and tie, he went and cashed an $85 check, then mailed the letters to the school. While at the post office, he filed a form for a 30-day hold on all mail delivery. He also mailed a letter and a key to his own house. Before he went home, he drained the rest of his mother's bank accounts. He also cashed bonds worth two grand. By 3 p.m., Frederick called home in order to get a ride home, which John picked up his youngest son. Once at home, he did the same thing he did to Patricia, waited till Frederick was inside, and then shot him. But unlike Patricia, Frederick saw the gun raised to him. Like Patricia, one shot and Frederick died instantly. Just like the others, he was dragged into the ballroom. But then John Jr. came home. John Jr. was supposed to have soccer practice, but it was a cold day. Practice was canceled, so he came home. John Sr., though, got the drop on him as John Jr. walked in. John Sr. raised the gun to the son that was named after him, but John Jr. was able to dodge a headshot, only getting shot in the back at first. John Sr. kept firing at him, even drawing a second gun, a 9mm handgun, and shot with both guns until John Jr. had finally stopped moving. John Jr. was shot 10 times. With that, his family was dead. He moved the bodies to be side by side, but underneath where he laid Alma in the floors above. After that, he prayed for forgiveness. By 5 p.m., what he sent to his house came, but he set it aside for now because he had more work to do. At 7, he called his pastor, telling him the same excuse as before, that the family was going to North Carolina to look after Helen's sick mother. He even called the drama teacher mentioned before to tell him Patricia was going away and was going to miss some time. And still, that drama teacher didn't immediately put two and two together. Hindsight might be 2020, but holy shit, does this drama teacher have no balls. Once he was done with all the phone calls, he sat down and wrote several letters. The first to his mother-in-law, then his sister-in-law. Pretty much he wrote to his friends and family with reasons he decided to upgrade from Super Karen to Psycho Karen. He literally wrote in one to his own pastor that he felt that God wanted this because he didn't answer John's prayers. So he was definitely trying to reason with himself that these killings were justified. Anyways, after the letter writing, he placed them in a locked desk drawer, placed the key he mailed to himself, for whatever reason, on the desk with the note. The note instructed whomever found the bodies to call the police and mail the letters. And then he got to work cleaning the house, again. Then he cut his own image out of every picture, turned on a radio to a religious station, turned down the thermostat so that the bodies would decompose slower in the late fall weather, and then he departed. The bodies were not discovered until December 7th. John had left the lights on, and letters and prep only gave him merely weeks before someone would suspect something. Well, it turned into close to a month. It was only after neighbors, people who had immediate knowledge of the family, began to notice that the lights were on day and night and began to go out. Then they all noticed that no movement was coming from the place, so the police were called in. They broke in through a window in the basement and the bodies were discovered. But John Liss had a month's head start. He took a train to Denver, Colorado. There he started a new life, under the name Bob Clark. He again went from job to job under this alias. He even remarried a woman named Dolores Miller. Then he moved to Virginia in a town I have no idea how to say the name, so just deal with me just saying Virginia and look it up for yourself. There, he became an accountant again for a small firm, but he was still on the run, and this all didn't happen in the span of a couple of years. 18 years he was on the run, but one program on television would bring his past back to haunt him. John Walsh Strikes Again In May of 1989, a segment on John List was aired on America's Most Wanted. John Walsh and crew had a sculptor named Frank Bender make a bust of what John List would look like as an older man. Not only did this bust look like the supposed Bob Clark, but he even got the type of glasses John List was wearing right. Two weeks after the broadcast on June 1st, 1989, John List was arrested at work. 
To the people who knew John List as Bob Clark, he hadn't changed. He was still a boring man who was very religious in nature, but they thought he was harmless. That day, those who knew Bob Clark found out how demented and sick he could really be. At first, he told the cops he was Bob Clark. He stuck with that story for a long time, before his one mistake came back to haunt him. His fingerprints. If he hadn't registered the handguns, his fingerprints wouldn't have been on file. Because of the fingerprint evidence, he ended up confessing and was sent back to New Jersey. John List decided to go to trial instead of pleading guilty. He pled not guilty by reason of insanity. During the trial, a court-appointed psychiatrist diagnosed John with OCD. Not surprising. Did you see all the things he did during the day he killed his family? John testified that it was financial hardships that put a strain on his mental state, which led to what he did. Not surprising that he was found guilty of five counts of first-degree murder. And he showed no remorse, continuing to justify his actions. Remember, he was claiming that his mental state was impaired, but he was found guilty because of his actions showed the opposite. He was meticulous. He planned everything, from where to put the bodies to even how he was going to get away with it. Still, he tried to use the mental state as an argument again when he tried to appeal his sentence, claiming to have PTSD from the two wars he was in. But he never really saw any action. He was a paper pusher in the army. Not surprising that these appeals were denied. In 2002, during an interview, he did show some remorse, stating he wished he didn't do what he did. But he still held on to the fact that he was justified and that his family was awaiting him in heaven, pretty much thinking that he would be forgiven by them by now. Either way, in 2008, he got his wish. He died in a prison hospital at age 82 after contracting pneumonia. I said during the Chris Watts video that John List was way worse than Chris Watts, and I stand by that. He was just as selfish as Chris Watts. While Chris just wanted Poontang, John wanted his family to be just as God-fearing and orderly as himself. When his family did the remotest thing normal, he did not like it, but what pushed him over the edge was the same as Chris Watts. Money. Though it took 18 years to catch him, he was caught. Proof that you never can really escape your past. Family Annihilators will return on March 16th. This time, with a YouTuber who killed his family and planned a bigger crime spree. Trey Eric Sessler, aka Mr. Anime.